let's get down to business. Thanks for coming out tonight. I wrote me a manual, a step by step booklet for you to get. Oh, I make money moves. You can't see me, my time is now. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of The Massive Joe's Show, a fitness times business. I am here in relatively sunny Birmingham, UK, out on a balcony here at the Crown Plaza NEC over the Body Power weekend, sitting across from my good man, CEO of Redcon One, Aaron Singerman. Yes, very happy to be here on the show, Joe. This is definitely in a, think of all the podcasts I've done, I've never done one on a balcony overlooking water, certainly not in the UK. So we, this we, is unique. We, we were just saying, this is my first podcast uh, where I'm actually going to get a tan at yes, the same time. Yes, <laughs> yeah, This is unusual. It's nice. It's nice. <laughs> gonna, I'm going to try to get a tan. Hopefully I don't get burnt here in the UK. <laughs> Aaron, thank you for uh, for making the time uh, on this, uh, it's Saturday morning here, yeah. in, here in the UK and we're shooting this before day two of the Body Power Expo. Right. Uh, so I appreciate you taking the time. To, uh, to, to sit down with me and, and record this podcast. My I'm pleasure. I'm excited for this podcast because I think you're a, a, a very unique guest uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of background in, in obviously business and fitness and you've done a whole lot in the, the supplement side of uh, of the industry. So I'm excited to kind of break it down for the listeners and, uh, and, and, and kind of give them as much value as possible. And I feel like we can really add a lot of value here on the business side of things more than anything. So, uh, so I'm pumped, I'm excited. Yeah, me too. So so first things first, fitness side of this podcast. Give us a little bit of a background into your background in fitness. How did you, you know, where, where did the seed first get planted uh, with your interest in, in fitness? Well, I, uh, I actually was got really interested in fitness and uh, bodybuilding at a very young age. Uh, when I was 13, um, I, you know what, I, it's hard to, to pinpoint why. I mean, I always liked Arnold and Predator and I watched Conan with my dad and, you know, uh, I, I wonder how much of that played a role in my interest at such a young age. But uh, by the time I was 13, I was getting dropped off. Everybody would be dropped off on the bus at their house and I would get dropped off at the French Riviera Spa, is the name of the gym, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Metairie, Louisiana, in New a suburb of New Orleans. Sure. And um, so I would get dropped off every morning when, or every evening uh, at around 3.30 after school and I would go in there and work out. And so uh, I started working out uh, five days a week when I was 13. I didn't make a whole lot of progress, but in my head, you know, my goal was to be a pro bodybuilder. Uh -huh. I got Flex Magazine. I remember all the issues. I would read them back and front. I think from, I have had a very obsessive personality yep. from the time that I was a teenager, where I was just like, I would get immersed in the things that I wanted to do to, a, to probably, you know, an unhealthy level. Um, and so I would read every magazine. I would ride my bike to Barnes & Noble. I would read every bodybuilding book, every diet book. I would read every magazine when I didn't have the money to buy them. So I would sit there for hours and hours and hours every day that I could and read these magazines and books. And, um, and so I was just really, really into it at a young age. And um, that kind of transitioned into doing a bodybuilding competitions. I did my first show when I was 18 mm -hmm. um, as a novice. I ended up doing uh, about six or seven shows as a, uh, as a young man, like early 18, 19, 20, 21. And uh, I quickly found out that I did not have the genetics to be Mr. Olympia. Mm -hmm. So I loved Dorian Yates back then. And I, uh, I, I always identified with the Blood and Guts books because in his book he talked about having not having great genetics, but having great work ethic. Yeah. And I realized for me that uh, that wasn't going to be me mm -hmm. <laughs> very early on because I had other people that I trained with that were having much better results than me. Sure. And uh, it was like, I, I remember when I was uh, made a very bad decision. I don't recommend this to anybody out there, but when I was 17, I took steroids for the first time. Mm -hmm. And me and another kid took them together. And man, I was like, damn, this kid is like way getting way better results than me. Mm -hmm. And I think that I, I realized very early on that this wasn't gonna be my future. Mm -hmm. But I loved fitness and bodybuilding so much. Uh, I really loved um, the industry, I loved all the stuff. You know, I, Like I said, I was really immersed in it. So I always wanted that to be something that I would do in some way or another. And I spent a lot of time as a personal trainer, yep. working at supplement stores, mm -hmm. you know, trying to be involved one way or another. Unfortunately, uh, around that same time that I tried steroids, I got very involved in drugs uh -huh. and recreational drugs. Mm -hmm. And it got worse and worse to the point where I was addicted to heroin and uh, spent a majority of my young adult life uh, trying to get more drugs mm -hmm. instead of trying to get educated or um, really anything. And, uh, and so at one point in time, you know, we had uh, 
we had been evacuated. I was a refugee from Hurricane Katrina and I lost all my, my worldly possessions and I moved to Houston uh, with my family. And, uh, and, and at that point in my life, I was at a real low where, um, where I had met a girl who was uh, selling cocaine and uh, basically all day long I injected drugs, heroin and then cocaine and uh, life was really, really not going good. And uh, one day we had a, uh, this is a very fast version of the story, but mm -hmm. I had a, my, our close friend, my close friend who died at our, at our house in a drug overdose. And when we were in the other room, he came back and the, and the kid was dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I have been exposed to violence and death before in my life, but for whatever reason, it hit me very hard because he was my friend mm -hmm. and because he was like one minute he's there and the next minute he was dead. And the girl and I got into a huge fight over her wanting to me to move his body. Mm -hmm. And so this, like all this stuff, you know, the fact that my friend was dead, the fact that he, you know, um, part of being dying is unfortunately you re relieve your bowels. So it's, he smelled terrible, it was scary looking, she was screaming at me to move him. And it was like some kind of weird, you know, like you hear like a, a breaking point or whatever, where mm -hmm. it's like, what the fuck am I doing here? Why am I doing this? How did this, how is this my life? And, uh, and how is this guy dead? You know, it was just like a very crystallizing moment. And I basically looked at her, it like all hit me and I ran out of there. Literally, I ran out of there, got in my car, drove back to my apartment, locked the door and decided that I would change my life. Yep. And, um, and literally, I, I basically made a 180 turn in my entire life, and I changed uh, everything that I was doing. And while I didn't, like, it, it certainly wasn't like, you know, now I'm going to be a success. Yep. I started heading in the right direction, and I stopped doing drugs. You know, I stopped hanging out with a lot of the, those people, and, uh, and I started shifting my life and trying to figure out what I was going to do uh, mm -hmm. with my life. Sure. And... Um, so I was training at a gym. About a year later, uh, I had my own car. I was doing good. You know, so things I, were going good. How old are you at this point? Because we've kind of we've gone yeah. from like teens to yeah. I, early twenties to. So I lived in Baton Rouge um, and competed till I was twenty-one. I moved yep. back to Louisiana. The hurricane happened in two thousand five. Yep. So that's I was twenty-five at that point, point. Um, and I started getting my shit together um, about a year and a half later. Uh, close to 2007. Okay. So I was 27, um, I believe, when my friend passed away and, and all this happened, right around there. I'm 38 now, so it's not that long ago. It's like 10 years. Yeah, yeah. In, the, in the scheme of things, this is not that long. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I was working at this gym, and uh, it was actually um, more of a, uh, a rehab facility. Mm -hmm. And um, I was training people there, and I was doing really well. Um, Doing well enough that I got promoted, and and uh, you know people seemed to think that I had uh, potential. My whole life, I've been told in school by teachers, every that I had um, that I was an underachiever. Mm -hmm. I had all this potential, but I was an underachiever. You know, I did very well on all the standardized test scores, and you know I would have been able to go to a very good school, and you know I had I had the, the capabilities. And people would say you're an underachiever, and I would always take that as a compliment. Mm -hmm. And be like, oh, well, at least I couldn't do something if I wanted to. Yeah, um, and so. By the time I was at that gym uh, training people, I felt like I was doing pretty good. And there was a gentleman there, a trainer, who had a brand new Porsche. Mm -hmm. And even though I never was able to afford nice stuff in my life, uh, I always liked nice stuff. Yeah. You know, I always liked nice cars and clothes and vacations and watches and all that show. Look at it, but I would just think it would never be me. Yeah. And so uh, this guy was a nice guy, but he was always busy. He was always training people. Mm -hmm. So um, he came in when we were both, uh, he, he had food to eat or something like that. And he came into the break room and I said, hey man, how do I get a Porsche like that? Like, what do I gotta do? Um, and he goes, you're never gonna get a Porsche like that. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, like I was a not, slap, slap not, in the was, face right there. I was not, uh, I wasn't expecting <laughs> that. And, uh, and I was like, what? And uh, he's like, no. He's like, do you, uh, do you love training people? Uh, I said, not really. And he goes, yeah, I can tell. He goes, I can tell you don't love it. He goes, I look forward to coming every morning. I stay late because I want to. I enjoy training these people, helping them, uh, and, and them seeing their goals is, uh, is what I like doing. He's like, so uh, that's the reason why I'm here so much yep. and why I keep these clients and why I get more and why they tell each other, you know, word of mouth, I get more. Um, he's like, because I love it. He's like, I don't feel like I'm working. I enjoy being mm -hmm. here. And he goes, and that's why I have the Porsche. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck. I was like, you're right. I'm never going to get a Porsche. I was, like, I'm never, I was like, I'm not, I don't enjoy it. And he goes, well, what do you love to do? Like, he's like, think about what you love to do. And I honestly couldn't come up with an answer. Yep. But that question kind of haunted me. And I went back to the apartment that night and I was thinking like, what do I love to do? Like, what, 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 do I, what is my passion? Mm -hmm. And uh, the only thing I could think of was bodybuilding. And I was like, 
I, I'm not going to be Dorian Yates. I already yeah. know that. You yeah. know, um, there's nothing. I, I kept thinking like, there's nothing that I could do to make money in bodybuilding. And then it kind of hit me where I was like, you know, there's other things around bodybuilding that I could do to make money. And uh, so I started thinking about like, who are those people? And I thought of like Peter McGuff, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Steve Blackman, who owns yeah. MD, and uh, obviously Joe Weider and Ben Weider and uh, Drew Mannion. And I started thinking of the other things that are possible, you mm -hmm. know, to make money promoting shows and writing books. And so I started thinking, you know, maybe I could do some of that. Mm -hmm. And so the next uh, big question, right, is how do you do that? There's yeah. no, you can't apply for a job to be Ben Weeder, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, there's no, oh, I'm going to be Peter McGuff. It doesn't work like that. So um, the my only answer that I could come up with at the time was to start um, immersing myself the way that I did uh, in fitness and bodybuilding when I was a kid in the industry. Yep. And so um, I started posting every day on the MD forums. Uh, and I, everybody used all these names like Swole Gun 69 and all this stuff. Well, from the very beginning, I used my name, Aaron Singerman. Because mm -hmm. uh, I figured like, this is probably not gonna help me, but you never know. I mean, maybe people are gonna see my name and I'm gonna contribute you know, stuff of value. Yep. And the posts are gonna help somebody and they're gonna notice. And then, you know, in my mind, I thought, you know, maybe um, Steve Blackman looks at these boards and is gonna say, this kid could be good, mm -hmm. you know, or something. Or at the time it was Dave Palumbo was the uh, editor, the, the online editor, and John Romano was the senior editor. Mm -hmm. And I was like, maybe these guys will notice me. And that was my, my goal was like, no, oh, I'll do something that'll get me noticed. And it didn't happen right away, even though I was spending thousands of posts um, that first year, I don't know, I did like 10,000 posts that I was, so I started uh, branching out. And so what I would do is I would send articles, I would write articles and I'd send them into Muscle Mag and the Flex and, and not, nobody would ask me to do it, I'd just do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I would uh, listen to radio shows and I would send emails to the, uh, after every show to the, uh, to the hosts of the email of the radio show, and um, that was like Dan Solomon from Pro Bodybuilding Weekly, and uh, I sent to uh, Dave Palumbo, and and a whole slew of others. Uh, Larry Pepe was doing a radio show then, and uh, one of them was Carl Lenore from Superhuman Radio, mm -hmm. and uh, he had a, a long, he had done quite a few shows by that point. This is uh, still on 2007, um, towards the end of 2007, but uh, I decided I would like criticize him. Mm -hmm. So instead of being like, I usually it would always be positive. You know, I try to do like the, be like that in life in general. I sent him a critical email where I was like, you know what, Carl, I'm very disappointed that you're promoting this can see eye drops. It's like, you know, this is a bullshit product. You're not going to put eye drops in your eyes and then you're going to correct your vision. Mm -hmm. and so I wrote him and he was like, and he got like, I guess, kind of butthurt. And he was like, he was like, wrote me back and he's like, can you, can you talk? And I was like, oh, shit. So he, he uh, me and him got on the phone. He goes, "Man, I want to let you know it's not a bullshit product." He started telling me and like basically selling me on Ken C. Eye Drops and being like, "You know, I don't like that. You know, I don't want to be thought of as a shell or uh, promoting uh, bullshit products." And so we got to talking. And when I had him on the phone, um, I was like, "How can I make this into something else?" I got the guy on the phone now because I never got anybody on the phone. Usually, like Dan would just write back, "Thanks." Yeah. Or some Palumbo never wrote me back ever. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Um, I was like, you know what would be cool, Carl? Has anybody ever interviewed you on your own show? And he goes, no, no. And I was like, well, what if I were to come on next week and interview you on your show and you could tell your story instead of always asking other people? And he's like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. He's like, yeah, we could do that. And uh, he was like, he's like, you know what? You actually uh, have a pretty good radio voice. He's like, you, you might be good at that. Yeah. And I was like, all right. And so uh, we made a plan, and I was all excited. I told my parents and everything, and I, and I spent a lot of time preparing for the radio show, writing notes and questions in advance, and just like, like, uh, like a maniac, like asking my, pretending like to sound comfortable to ask him the questions. And so we did the show, and I did, uh, you know, for somebody who'd never done a radio show before, I think I did a really, really good job, and he was impressed. And he said, um, he said, man, you're really good on the radio. Like I'm impressed at uh, how well you did and how well you spoke. And and I would like to uh, do something with you. Is there something that we could do? Like, what are you interested in? And I said, man, I love uh, bodybuilding. Will you do a bodybuilding radio show? Uh -huh. And he goes, well, I don't know much about bodybuilding, but if you uh, if you're interested and you want to do bodybuilding radio show, you know what? I'll do, I'll do it. I'll do a radio show with you. He's like, we have to keep it kind of interesting and fun though, because I'm not like hardcore into bodybuilding. And I said, all right, let's let's do it. And uh, that next week, we started a radio show called Off Topic Radio. 
And uh, we did uh, 300 hours and 100 episodes of Off Topic Radio, interviewing everybody from Milo Sarsev to, I mean, literally everybody in the, in the fitness industry. And uh, from, from crazy stuff like... Uh, uh, transvestite prostitutes <laughs> who worked who worked in muscle worship, all the way to you know Milos talking about uh, insulin, and we in, we we in, literally interviewed everybody that you can uh, you can imagine. Since we weren't directly affiliated with uh, a publication, a lot of people would do the show that wouldn't otherwise do it. Absolutely, and yeah. um, I mean it was a huge success, and we got a lot of uh, listenership. And when Dave Palumbo. Um, started RX Muscle in mm-hmm. 2008, the first person, I think one of the first people he called was me and said, hey, would you bring Off Topic Radio to uh, RX Muscle and make it your home? And so uh, I was very complimented and, and we did. And that began the relationship with Dave Palumbo, which eventually I ended up taking over for John Romano and he left. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was kind of like the, I guess you'd say like the number two guy at yep. RX Muscle. Yep. And I worked there for, uh, for quite a while, let's see, for about four years, three or four years, and I traveled the world with Dave covering bodybuilding all over the world, and I was always very good at networking, and uh, while Dave would go back to the room and kind of be like a loner, uh, I would go out and meet people and shake hands, and mm-hmm. I remember uh, at one point there, people were saying I was like the uh, governor of bodybuilding, because I always <laughs> went down and shook hands, talked to everybody, made Being friends. the diplomatic one. Yeah, yeah, well, because yeah. no, nobody really liked Dave that much, you know, this was sure. a, these days, he's more well-liked uh, by the, the people that run bodybuilding, but back then, we were kind of persona non grata, uh-huh. and so by me going and making friends with people, sometimes I could offset the, the, sure. the dislike yep. for Palumbo, yep. and uh, so eventually, he offered me the job as editor-in-chief, and the plan was for him to um, kind of take take a step back. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was selling advertising for RX Muscle. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was also running the site, I found a real uh, ability or knack to sell online media because I understood what it was doing. I understood the power and where it was going. And uh, we had so many unique visitors to the site at the time, I realized that that I was actually helping a lot of these um, Supplement companies, because yeah. at the time, a page in Flex Magazine is five thousand dollars, a page in Muscle and Fitness is twelve to fifteen thousand dollars, and you could get a static banner where you're going to get in front of hundreds of thousands of your consumers. This is before Facebook advertising and everything. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're going to get in front of all your consumers, the right demographic who's buying the supplements, and you're going to be able to do it for extremely cheap, for less than a page most mm-hmm. of the time in one magazine that's going to be seen as somebody is you know sitting on the toilet flipping through it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, uh, I was very good at selling it. I would speak to these marketing directors and explain and show the numbers and show our click-through rate and discuss uh, the cost or impression and like stuff that they didn't even know what it was. Yep. And, um, and so I brought in a lot of money. At one point, I was bringing in over a million dollars a year in advertising budget to Arx Muscle, which was not, I mean... Before that, it was like nothing. Yep. You know, uh, maybe we were bringing in 10, 12,000 bucks a month. Dave is great at what he does, but he is not a salesman. Yep. And he can't ask for money. Yep. So, um, and he still can't. You know, that's still a, a problem for him. So I was great at that, and I was bringing in a lot of money. And as a result, um, I made a lot of commission, and I did great. Um, and when I left there, I ended up leaving. Uh, by then, we had started Blackstone Labs with PJ and I, mm-hmm. and uh, PJ Braun and I. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was such an interesting opportunity uh, because it was it was strictly, you know, being um, seizing the opportunity, which I think a lot of people don't realize in life. There's always opportunities around you. It's just a matter of um, doing it, you know, taking advantage of the opportunity, seizing it. I mean, how many times have people said, I have a great idea and then don't act on their idea? I mean, all the time. All the time. Yeah. Man. And, all the time. Uh, and so it's like it's like a. Um, a thing that, that everybody can identify with where they were like, man, I wish I would have done that. I saw a really cool, a guy I really like named uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, mm-hmm. Really, if you guys haven't seen him, Google him and watch some YouTube videos by his book. Uh, but he talks about procrastination and like uh, achieving goals. Mm-hmm. And he says something that's really interesting about if you take the last 10 years of your life and you focus all of your energy that you spend watching YouTube and videos and playing video games and all the bullshit that you do, right? Zero procrastination. And you do zero. And yep. you take all 10 years yep. and you put every moment into achieving your goal. Uh-huh. Where would you be? And, you know, I think about that and I'm like, damn. It's like, I, you know, I pride myself on trying to be very efficient with my time. But, of course, I mean, I don't know where I would be if I was able to focus. And it's funny because I think back to the, when I'm saying it's impossible to be a pro bodybuilder, I wonder if I would have taken every energy and every ounce and focused into that, you know, because I say it's impossible. Yeah. Or uh, basketball. I was not a good basketball player, mm-hmm. but if I focused every moment of my time instead of, you know, bodybuilding or fitness or drugs or 
girls and I focused on basketball, mm. who's to say I couldn't have been a good basketball player, right? Yeah. So you think about that and, um, and man, it kind of makes you feel like, fuck, I should be doing things differently, right? <laughs> uh, it's good food for thought. Good food it? for thought. Yeah, um, no, I'm, I'm familiar with, uh, with, with that, that quote, as a matter yeah. of fact. So, it's a yeah. good one. Yeah, it's, it's a good, good one. one. Um, so, um, so PJ and I had this great opportunity where um, a person that we were working for at Iron Mag Labs had a product that he believed was going to become illegal. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he told me that he was going to dispose of all his Super DMZ was the name of the product. Sure. And he was going to dispose of the 5,500 units that he had. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and basically, I was like, hey, man, don't do that. So give them to me and, uh, and I'll sell them. Uh -huh. I'll figure out a way to get rid of them and mm -hmm. I'll give you all your money back and I'll split the profit with yep. you. And, uh, and essentially he was like, oh, okay. Uh, I had no kids at the time. Yeah. I had no real concerns. I wasn't, I mean, I didn't have anything to lose, I felt like. And yeah. so he took the opportunity. The product didn't become illegal. And as a result, we brought in another product called Angel Dust and another product, another product, and so on and so forth. And uh, based on seizing that opportunity, created a, a company that ended up, uh, before I left, was the 27th fastest growing privately owned company in the country. And that's number one in health. Yeah, and number one in yeah. health. Yeah. Now, since then, obviously, I left uh, a little over two years ago, and uh, me and PJ parted ways in a uh, rather dramatic fashion, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, um, I always call it a divorce, because mm -hmm. we were best friends for over a decade, and we had built this great business together, mm -hmm. and it was a, a, a big partnership dispute, which is uh, which is essentially like a divorce, like a business divorce. Yeah. And, um, and so when it all happened, it was it was very dramatic. I was not expecting it to happen, um, but we, me and him hadn't been getting along for a long time. So uh, even though I wasn't expecting it to happen, um, we had been butting heads on everything. Mm -hmm. So even little tiny stuff in this argument that we had over firing uh, somebody who needed to be fired ended up becoming uh, a huge argument that was that basically broke us uh, apart. Cool. And. Um, it's funny because when it happened, this is another thing I talk about a lot, is when it happened, I was, uh, for, for a whole day, for only one day, but for a whole day I was depressed and I felt like, felt like, a, um, like I could lose my baby, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I put all this time and effort into it. And, um, and it could have been a really bad moment in my life. It could have been uh, devastating, but instead of it being devastating, I took the opportunity to use that as fuel to create something new and use that negativity for positivity. And, uh, and that ended up being, um, it ended up basically being the best thing that ever happened. Mm -hmm. So from the worst thing could have been the worst thing that ever happened in my life ended up being the, the best thing that ever happened because I was able to get rid of a lot of drama in my life. Mm -hmm. And because when, in our separation agreement, basically I was able to compete directly immediately. Um, and so I created Redcon One really the day after, two days later after I uh, after we figured out everything, we started to sort out what I could do, what he could do, and you know the money situation stuff, and um, and I basically jumped on it, mm -hmm. and I uh, hired Eric Hart, and a lot of people, several people came with me from Blackstone. Yep. We started a few days later, and uh, we had products within four months, and we were selling and. You know, um, we have far surpassed Blackstone. So Blackstone's best best month ever. You know, uh, now would be considered a bad month mm -hmm. for Redcon One. Would be a really bad month now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Redcon One has gotten to places. You know, me and you talked yesterday about Vitamin Shop. You know, we'll be um, we'll have the um, biggest sports supplement release in Vitamin Shop history. And um, you know, being in 800 locations, we're already in over a thousand GNC locations. We got accepted to the military, uh, which is another 400 doors. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're still doing more a month B to C. Uh, we have to do uh, anywhere between a thousand to five thousand direct to consumer orders a day mm -hmm. off of the website. Mm -hmm. um, so all of the successes that Blackstone had, because that would be considered in my mind a really big success, because Blackstone was the first. Uh, business in hardcore fitness supplements in America that I saw doing that kind of volume yep. in direct-to-consumer sales. Yep. And uh, so I was able to take that and bring it over and, uh, and even scale it a little bit. And then all the failures that we had that I didn't like about Blackstone, like some of the marketing stuff, you know, I'm a, I'm a biggest fan of uh, butts and boobs as anybody, any guy, <laughs> but like, I don't, I don't, that was something where I was like, every day it would bother me, the direction that we were heading, because yep. that, I have kids and I have a wife and people would look at, you know, this is something that probably some of the listeners will understand, some of them won't, but I have, uh, you know, families and stuff and Darielle picks up the kids and is part of, you know, uh, 
like school moms and you say I own Blackstone and they look at things like, oh, uh, Darielle's into a porn. <laughs> seen, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and We've so, seen those ads. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know what? And, and uh, it, I look, sex sells, but I don't know if it sells sports supplements. Sure. I, I don't know. I have went a whole different direction mm -hmm. uh, with it, and, uh, and I'm really proud of it. So when I show somebody or when somebody takes a look at the Instagram, I'm happy. I want them to look, and I want, and I feel like I've created something really. Uh, different and special, and uh, and I did a lot of things that I really wanted to do that I knew I could do, but it was too late for Blackstone. Uh -huh. So, um, so that's kind of where we are right now. It took you through a very fast journey. There you though. go. Yeah. No, no, no. That was that was fantastic, and uh, you've done a fantastic uh, a job of explaining that. Obviously, we've known each other for yeah. for for a whole bunch yeah. of time, uh, but the listeners, I'm sure that a, a whole bunch of listeners are like, wow. <laughs> I mean, we just thought Aaron was, you know, came out of nowhere and, yeah. and, and started this Redcon One supplement company. But you know, it's really good hearing you kind of uh, explain that so succinctly as well, because it's a, it's a, a, one of the quotes that I'm a big fan of was the late great Steve Jobs um, uh, mentioned a quote in his Stanford commencement speech where he said, "You can't join the dots of life looking forwards; you can only join them looking backwards." Yeah. And I think that your your succinct version of, of everything that's kind of got you to where you are today, you really exemplify that is there's a whole bunch of dots that yeah. had they not connected oh, yeah. you know you wouldn't be doing what you're doing today crazy um, and so I really I want to kind of break some of them down because I think this is where we can we can really add a lot a lot of value to the listeners so I'm gonna go right right back to uh, to your teenage years and the kind of steroid use and how that kind of led into the recreational drug yeah. use because I think this is something that you know uh, uh, in this industry is obviously very prevalent especially sure. with younger guys you know steroids arms pro hormones all that sort of thing but no one kind of talks about the fact that for a lot of people that is you know it can become a bit of a gateway into into recreational drug use and then quite hard recreational drug use as it was with your, you know, with you. Yeah. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And, and, and more particularly, you know, how do people get out of that cycle? You, you know, you mentioned your epiphany. You obviously had to go very deep down the rabbit hole yeah. to kind of flip it and, and, and come back out. But, you know, if you, you know, if you don't go that deep, and hopefully most most people who find themselves don't have to go that deep, right. uh, you know, how does that kind of pan out? So, um, first off, I will say that I do think uh, that steroids can be a gateway, and, and I uh, I think back for myself, being willing to stick a needle in your body at yeah. 17, yeah. it was scary. I mean, I remember it very distinctly, like doing it, and it was in my friend's bathroom, and I was very nervous. And I did it myself. You know, there he was like, "Do you want me to do it for you?" And I was like, "No, I would rather do it myself." And, and I did it. And I was shaking and like, you know, I was very nervous to do it. Yeah. And uh, it was a Sustanon uh, Red Eject, which you know, it's funny that I remember all the details, right? Yeah. But I, I was very nervous, and I did it. And um, as a result, uh, I think that if you're willing to put a needle in your body uh, at that age and, and overcome that kind of hurdle. Um, then I, I think that it allows you a more easy transition to putting a needle in your arm to sure. feel a certain way. Yeah. Uh, and, and I really truly believe that. And you know, I don't think that it's that's always the case. And I certainly don't think that everybody who does steroids is going to um, do injectable recreational drugs. But I do think it does loosen your sort of morals, mm -hmm. you know, or what's acceptable to you. Because mm -hmm. everybody, right, morals is different from one person to the other. Like I may think something's wrong, you may think that's totally okay, yep. and so on and so forth. But I think that if you go that direction at a young age, um, then your morals have kind of shifted where it's like, yeah, it was not that big a deal uh -huh. to do that. Uh -huh. um, so then putting a needle in your arm, you think, oh, well, you already did it in your butt. Yes. There's not that much difference. Yeah. And uh, so I do think that it, that it can lead that direction. And uh, I'm not a, a, a fan of young men uh, or young women mm -hmm. uh, taking steroids. I think it's an adult decision. I'm a libertarian. I don't talk about politics very much, but I'm a libertarian mm -hmm. by choice. And I think that as an adult, when you are, uh, when you are, you know, an adult in life, you should be able to make adult decisions. I don't, obviously, that's not the case because um, there's legalities, which is a whole different thing. Of obviously, course, I'm not yeah. suggesting somebody break the law, but yeah. uh, at 17, 18, 19, 20, even 21, I think that you're you're not fully there mm -hmm. uh, to make a decision like that. And sometimes, um, big muscles sound alluring, but later in life, you may may really regret, of course. you know, those decisions. So. Number one is, yes, I do think it's a gateway drug. Number two, how do you get out of it uh, is a tougher question. Uh -huh. Because everybody, uh, when you start doing the drugs that I was doing, like heroin, unfortunately, you get, um, 
you get addicted physically. Mm -hmm. And that was really my problem where I felt very stuck mm -hmm. in that life where it was like, I would be very sick. And I, if I was sick, I wouldn't be able to function as a, as a productive member of society at any degree. Mm -hmm. I couldn't hold the job. I couldn't you know, go get food. I couldn't take care of myself because mm -hmm. I was so sick. Mm -hmm. So it's like, once you're in that kind of circle of addiction, uh, it becomes very difficult to get out of it. And I think, you know, you have to figure out, you need to get some way, some distance from it. And I think that's a really tough thing. And that's why rehab works for some people. It didn't work for me. I went to a few rehabs and it didn't work for me, but it does work for some people because it gives you distance from the addiction. Mm -hmm. So the farther that you have away from those times that you're doing that, the better. And that's why like people ask me, hey, can I, should I do a 28 day program? And I, I always say, no, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. If you really want to have a chance, at getting away, you need to get as much distance from the last time you do drugs. So like for, for me, I have absolutely no, like there's no, there's no potential for me to even go back and do the drugs True. Um, because I'm so far away from it, um, not just in, in distance and time that I've done it, but also where I am in my life. Mm -hmm. That it's not, it's not even like a possibility. My wife can't even, I tell these stories and my wife doesn't even believe it's reality. Like almost. it's a different person. Yeah, she hears yeah. my mom saying things that happened yeah. when I was uh, a kid. Yeah. And she's like, I can't even believe that that's yeah. reality, you know? <laughs> and I'm glad she can't. Yeah. She wouldn't yeah. have liked that's that. It's a good thing, right? She it's wouldn't have liked thing. that, Aaron. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, you know, it's, I think for people, the best thing to do is try to figure out how to, if you want to get away from it, figure out how to distance yourself from it for as long as you can, whether that's go on vacation and be sick for a week, mm -hmm. you know, or if you have the uh, resources, go to a 90 day program, mm -hmm. stay at your, your folks house and tell them, you know, don't give you any money. I mean, I don't know what the solution is for each individual, but my best suggestion, cause like well, the one thing that's good is like people do AA meetings, NA meetings. I didn't do any of that stuff yep. um, because for me, it, uh, it just brought back, it was a negative thing where all these, these people talked about drugs, but sometimes being accountable to a group of people can help people also. So, mm -hmm. you know, my, my situation is so unique that I don't, uh, like to this day, I drink alcohol occasionally socially. Mm -hmm. I would never suggest somebody who has a drug addiction in their past to drink alcohol. So uh -huh. it's like, I'm very careful with what I suggest because um, my case is a little different. Yep. Um, so I, I uh, you know, my best suggestion, like I said, is get away from it. As yep. far as you can, find a way to get away mm -hmm. and have some time under your belt. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's something that, you know, it, 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 I've, I've done a whole bunch of content on, on performance enhancing drugs because it is a big part of our industry, um, whether people like to admit that or not. Um, you know, one of my, my big concerns with it is, aside from the long-term health effects that we, we still really don't fully understand, right. uh, you know, is the short-term psychological effects that I think a lot of people just, just completely sweep under the carpet is it's like, you know, it goes back to, to what you're saying, if you're willing to put a needle in your body for a performance enhancing drug, well, you know, that's a gateway to injecting recreational drugs, but then you spoke a little bit about the physical dependence on recreational drugs, but I think also there's a, there's a whole lot of psychological dependence on performance enhancing drugs as well that I've seen personally, you know, people I know quite well in the industry who have kind of gone down that path and they, they become psychologically addicted oh, yeah. to, to performance enhancing oh, yeah. drugs. Whether or not it's physical, it's a, it's a psychological addiction. Because you're, you're um, especially in our industry, you wrap your, uh, your self-worth around how your physique 100%. is, how you look. 100%. And uh, I mean, I'm not immune to that either. I, I was looking at, uh, Eduardo had a video of me at the, at the gym two years ago, like yep. flexing. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, I was like, look how big I was, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's, I mean, that's everybody. And the more that you wrap your, your worth around how your physique looks, the more, I mean, imagine if your whole, your whole career is based on that. And then you see yourself looking like that and you're like, damn, I don't look like that now. Of yeah. course there's a, because a big component on how you look like that, mm -hmm. whether, like you said, whether you want to admit it or not mm -hmm. is, uh, is drugs. Yeah. And, uh, and if you're taking a bunch and you go to taking none, you're going to have a very distinctly different look mm -hmm. of your uh, physique. 100%. And and, you, and another part is that um, you know male hormones. Yep. Um, if you have high androgen levels, you do whether you know whether you want to say it or not, you behave differently, mm -hmm. and uh, you may be uh, more aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, you may feel physically uh, better, and then feel physically worse when your androgen levels are low. Um, and, it, and it can change the way you behave around people, and you know. Hormones, I mean, I can't, and my wife, you know, although she probably doesn't like to admit it, she, when, <laughs> at, there's a point in her month where she is more emotional and will snap a little easier. Yep. And uh, while she's wonderful at all times of the month, this time maybe she's a little bit more, you know, and it's 
because of hormones. Mm -hmm. So of course, if you're a man taking a whole hell of a lot of exogenous hormones, you're gonna have a different behavior too. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Flip, flipping the, the switch real quick. So you mentioned the, the story, and I really like this story about the Porsche, yeah. uh, when you were, yeah. uh, you know, you, you were personal training and, and that was kind of a, a bit of a slap in the face to go, yeah. you know what, I don't really enjoy what I'm doing. I might, I might like it, but yeah. I'm not truly passionate about it. You know, I, I really love that story because this is something that I'm huge on from a, from a business and, and I guess kind of life advice perspective is, you know, I see so many people who, you know, first of all, hate what they do and admit that they hate what they do, but they're kind of trapped for, you know, yeah. financial uh, reasons or whatever the reason may be. And then you kind of have people who think that they're passionate about what they do, but they're not really, it's, right. not, it's not true passion. Right. They, kind of, they kind of like what they do for a living. And then you've got people that, you know, are insanely passionate about what they do on, on the other end of the spectrum. And so I wanted to kind of just delve a little bit deeper into this. I mean, obviously that was the realization for you, but for a lot of people, you know, they may have a similar type of situation where come, someone slaps them across the face and says, you're never gonna have that nice thing that you want because you don't really enjoy what you're doing. But then taking that next step and saying, you know, coming to the realization and having consciousness that, okay, I need to make a change here. I need to actually go and pursue what it is that I am truly passionate about. How did that work in your mind? Well, uh, for me, uh, you know, I think I've always been pretty good at kind of like self-examination and then pivoting to what I think is the next best move. I'm not always right, but you know, this guy saying that to me was enough it caused me to do some self-examination. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you said, there's a lot of people in various different stages of that. I mean, I hear all the time, you know, thank God it's Friday, right? Of course. Um, they're yeah. so excited for the weekend and then, oh, Monday's coming, Monday's sad, yeah. right? I love Mondays, Monday's my favorite day. Of course. It's our busiest day and there's so much to do. We have meetings and we're planning the week and we're figuring out how to, how to you know, win that week and crush the month and new opportunities. Yeah, I just love it. I love it. Uh, and of course, Sunday for me is family day, which is also great. Uh, but when family day is over, man, I'm looking forward to Monday. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I see people say that, I'm like, damn, that sucks, man. Yeah, that sucks. And uh, and like people at my office, like the way to get more money, right? or the way to get promoted, or we do a performance bonus uh, uh -huh. at, for some of the uh, the different teams, right? Yeah. The way to get more, I always tell people, is to do more than what's required. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there people get paid their rate for the job. Mm -hmm. But then I reward um, people that go over and above, and I always do, and I think that's important to do. Mm -hmm. And some people hear that, and you can tell they're like, Pfft. like more? I'm already doing, you know what I mean? Like, why should I have to go over and above? Why? And that's like, Unfortunately, those are the people that are either doing something they don't love or somebody that's never going to succeed. So uh, this is definitely not me. Uh, I wish I could say this was me as a younger man. But if I were to go back and start over and do things again, mm -hmm. I would make sure that I was kicking ass and being the best at anything that I did. Mm -hmm. So whether I was personal training, it doesn't matter if I didn't love it. I would figure, focus, this is something that I'm sure everybody asks, I would figure out what the thing that I love is and then I would kill, I would put everything I had into each thing that I did mm -hmm. and I guarantee that that will bring success and put you closer to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. So if I'm working at McDonald's, I'm sweeping the shit out of that floor. Mm -hmm. I am going to be the best at McDonald's and I know that that will get me to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. As long as you're the best and you do more than is required, mm -hmm. I think it'll, it's always going to lead uh, to success. In terms of... Um, Finding what you love to do, that's a harder thing. Uh, for me, uh, it was it was difficult, but I had at least one thing. Mm -hmm. um, I remember talking to my mom. So my mom, when my dad passed away, my mom really doesn't do uh, a whole lot. You know, she is basically retired, mm -hmm. but she has a lot of free time. And, uh, and so I was talking to her about getting a job, like what she could do. And she's like, well, I'm 65, I don't know. There's nothing for me to really do. You know, and I said, well, what do you love? And she loves birds. Mm -hmm. She's like a bird lady. Mm -hmm. She's like, so many birds. Mm -hmm. I'm not into the birds, but she's, she's so into these <laughs> Each to their birds. own. Yeah, man. each to their own. Yeah. And she's like, but there's no money to make, there's no way to make money on birds. And I was like, that's bullshit, mom. Of course there's money to make money on birds. You, how much money do you spend on birds? A lot of money. I was like, okay, well, now you start thinking about what do you spend money on birds and how can you be part of that? How can you solve that problem for other bird ladies, right? Mm -hmm. um, so everybody's got something. It's just, it may not be easy to see what it, what it is mm -hmm. or how you're going to get there. You know, somebody admit like a, a good example is Quentin Tarantino loved uh, movies, yep. worked at a movie store. He loved movies. And uh, I'm sure when he was working at Major Video or whatever, Blockbuster, he's probably like, man, how the hell am I going to ever 
make movies, mm -hmm. but he started writing scripts and he started focusing. So he was there trying to figure out how to make a movie and lo and behold, all that energy, you know, now he's Quentin Tarantino, the famous movie guy, of right? The director, uh, writer. So, uh, you know, there are certainly ways to figure it out. It just may not be easy. You know, it's not gonna be easy. Yeah. No. Let's say, and, and I think this, you know, a lot of people listening, this is gonna be something that's gonna add the most value to them is let's say that, you know, you're doing something that you, you like, you enjoy, you know, but it's not what you're passionate about, but you know what it is that you are passionate about, but you've got financial responsibilities, you've got family responsibilities, you've got all of these responsibilities that are kind of, you know, forcing to you to continue down the path that you may like, but you're not truly passionate about. You know, what do you do in that situation? Well, you have to um, use your free time, like we talked about Jordan Peterson, you know, instead of watching TV, instead of spending time doing nonsense or whatever, you need to focus that extra time on pursuing your passion. Mm -hmm. uh, like when I talked about earlier about all the emails I was sending and all the posts I was doing on the boards and listening to radio shows and writing articles, I still had to pay the bills. Of course. So I still was a trainer over there at uh, the wellness center. I yep. wasn't, I wasn't able to just say, oh, I quit and now I'm gonna pursue my passion passion because that doesn't pay the bills, right? Correct. Uh, so I continued training people uh, until a point where the uh, Carl and I's radio show made enough money that I was able to stop. And I got to tell you, it was not an easy life. I was not rich by any means. I was literally like eating peanut butter and jelly and protein powder and like, you know, but I was able to have enough money. And fortunately for me, I didn't have that many responsibilities. I didn't have kids mm -hmm. or a wife or anything at that time mm -hmm. that I was able to, within a year, kind of transition away. Yep. Um, but man, I, I spent every ounce of free time. I didn't go on dates. I didn't meet girls. I didn't go out to bars. I didn't do any of that stuff. Yep. I wrote blog posts and wrote articles for no money. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that's what I focused on. So all that energy. And it, and it took me a year, but it may take many years. And that's the sucky part. It may take Two months, but more than likely it's a, a long process. And you just have to realize that um, if you quit, you're definitely not going to get there. That's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Guarantee you. So quit, much, so be. much truth. And I think this is where a lot of people kind of get caught up is they, you know, they hear these stories and, and you know, they hear the first part of this podcast and you're telling your, your story and they're like, okay, that was the clean break between, you know, personal training and then going and, and doing this. And then that was the clean break between the media side and the supplement side. And I think it's very rarely a clean break. There's right. always that transitional period where you literally have to make the, make the most of your 24 and, you know, 100% the Jordan Peterson thing is yeah. don't procrastinate. Yeah. You know, every spare moment you've got, put it into what you are truly passionate about and just be patient and, and you know, execute daily, mm. hourly, on the minute until you get there. Right. Um, and I think that's kind of where a lot of people get, get, they're like, you know, I want to go pursue what I'm passionate about, so therefore I need to make a clean break <laughs> from, exactly. from all my Stop responsibilities. Now, yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah. But, and that's daunting. That's yeah. daunting because Very. it's like, how am I going to pay the bills? Yeah. You know, and we live, in a, we live in a, a time of social media where you see uh, this stuff that, that is not reality. You don't see all the work and the suffering and the... Well, the, you, see, you see instant gratification. You see instant gratification. That's yeah. exactly what it is. And, and now that you can follow these people and, yep. you know, I, uh, like, for me, I stopped posting anything material. I made a uh, decision in my social media to not post anything uh, that could be, because I don't think that it's, you're doing any service to anybody and that's really not what life's about. Yep. So if you post a, a fancy car or something, really that, and I understand why people do it, and, and, I, and I get that, and I like fancy cars. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, I'd rather show the business life and the family stuff and what I think is important and what I think uh, that people should be pursuing. You yeah. know, what's really, what is, what is it really about for an entrepreneur? It's, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of downside we were talking about. Uh -huh. Now there's tremendous upside. Mm -hmm. Pursuing your passion is, and making money off it is, is uh, the ultimate thing, is I love going to work, I love what I do, yeah. um, you know, and I feel very lucky to be doing it. But there's also uh, tremendous stress and, uh, you know, there's a lot of downside to it. So I try to show everything as much as I can. Yeah. Um, along the way. Be as transparent as possible. Yeah, be as transparent yeah. as possible. One of the, the, the big things that I really picked up on was when you mentioned, you made that, that kind of, you were in that transitional period from the personal training to, you know, getting on the forums and posting, posting, posting. And you mentioned you did like 10,000 posts before it before it got yeah. anywhere. And I think this is a, you know, tying in, it's a good segue actually, because tying into the instant gratification social media world that we live in, right. you know, people, uh, you know, Let's say, for example, let's take that as an example, you know, might do 10 posts or 100 posts and it doesn't get them anywhere, so they give up. Right. 
you know, uh, and, and patience, I think. Patience and perseverance is something that really is lacking, uh, you know, tremendously with, with, with a lot of people in a lot of different aspects of their life is, you know, it's, sometimes it just takes a bit longer yeah. than you yeah. like it to. Of course, it's true. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just real life, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to move into, now, you, you, you mentioned the coming into the bodybuilding forums and then you know the work that you did with the radio show and then kind of getting into the the media side of the industry because i find that quite interesting uh, as you know you're kind of i guess entrance into the the business side of 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 the the health and fitness industry mm. so you mentioned some things about the the radio shows that like you were the first person to right. do that sort right. of thing yeah off topic radio was the first uh was the first one we were live yeah and that made it interesting because the uh there were all these live listeners yeah so we did a live radio show and then we also did a podcast that was available on itunes and sure. i don't think there was even a soundcloud then uh but uh was available various different um uh, mediums, uh -huh. but we did it live, so yep. uh, people could comment in, and uh, they would post on the forums yep. um, as we were going, and we would interact with the fans live. And this was something that wasn't ever done uh -huh. at that point. So you'd have a thousand plus people listening live that would tune in uh, on Sundays at eight o'clock, and they would literally sit there for three hours and participate in the show. Sure. And um, you know, now we have Facebook Live and Instagram Live, and you know, it's it's everywhere. Yeah. But at that point, it was extremely unusual that you could communicate with a podcast as it broadcasts live, uh -huh. and we. We had a lot of very passionate fans, and uh, and that led to other radio shows. I ended up doing Heavy Muscle Radio with Dave. Um, I did uh, Access Bodybuilding with uh, Christina Liberatore. Mm -hmm. um, I did I did many radio shows. I did a lot of podcasts. Yeah, and um, and those were very popular. And they're obviously they're having a kind of a resurgence now that we're talking about why you're doing this right now. Absolutely, These podcasts have come back in a really big way. Um, but at first, it was awesome because anybody could do it. Yep. And you could be listened to by a lot of people, and um, and yeah, I got to interact with a lot of fans, and I think that it helped even what we're doing right now, or when I do Instagram Live, or if I speak in front of a group of people, being able to speak uh, extemporaneously, you know, off the top of your head, you get you get ability to kind of go, and, mm -hmm. and I think that makes you seem more authentic, and I actually like doing it. Absolutely, yeah. I, and, and I feel like you know this is this kind of ties into you know where you went to in terms of the digital advertising piece at RX Muscle and generating all of that digital advertising income that you said didn't exist until you kind of came about and saw that opportunity and seized that opportunity. And I feel like you know uh, be, between you and I, this is kind of where we draw a lot of professional similarities in mm -hmm. the digital pieces. We understand where people's attention is lying, and we understand how to how to produce content to capture that attention. Right. So I wanted to kind of, you know, delve a little bit deeper into this and, and like where where does that come from from you? Like how did you how did you firstly see this opportunity to go, you know, there's the, there's something to be done here with, right. with podcasting and, and the ability to do it live. And then when you moved into RX Muscle, when you saw the opportunity, there are, you know, hundreds of thousands, whatever the number was, people visiting the website, no one's advertising, well, we can sell this advertising space, and the attention is shifting from looking at magazines yeah. to, you know, looking at, at digital medium. Sure. Where did that come from from you? Like, how, how did you spot that? Yeah. You know, I think that I've always had, uh, like, I think everybody has certain genetic gifts, like, uh, just like somebody has uh, bigger calves or the ability to build muscle faster. I think I've always had kind of an innate uh, business sense. Sure. You know, uh, my, my family, looking back uh, for generations, has been business owners. Mm -hmm. um, and um, my, my dad in that generation wasn't as successful for one reason or another, but in the past, there are, have come from a long line of business people yep. that own their own business that were uh, varying levels of success, but they, were, uh, they all were like business. Yep. And I think that I have some of that. So I, uh, I have spotted opportunities in business well. And so the RX Muscle was a, my first real example of spotting opportunity and then capitalizing on it and making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Most of it for Dave Palumbo, but you know, uh, for RX Muscle. <laughs> still, but still, right? But I spotted yeah. it and I did yeah. okay too. I was, yeah. I was, uh, uh, I got 10% of the money that I brought in. Mm -hmm. So um, I felt pretty good about that because sure. it ended up being good. For me, that was the most money I had made before. Mm -hmm. And um, so that kind of like, I, I kind of discovered that internet, um, I guess the ability to generate interest online through the RX muscle thing, because not just were we doing the digital advertising, but I was in front of people, you know, traveling the world doing YouTube videos. We actually were 
you know, this was a mistake, but Dave wanted to host all of the videos on the site, on the server. Uh -huh. So we never did YouTube. Like, we could have been extremely early adopters to YouTube. We yep. could have been, I mean, Dave is now doing good on YouTube mm -hmm. uh, because he switched over, but we had thousands and thousands and thousands of videos um, that were not put on YouTube because he wanted to host it on the site to, to keep that traffic. Where sure. Now we know that was probably a mistake. But mm -hmm. as a result, people were seeing me all the time. Um, the, the radio show was garnering attention. And people, when I go to shows, would know me. And, uh, and I thought, man, that's a valuable thing. Uh -huh. Because even if they're not, like, I'm not a bodybuilder, I'm not a, they're not maybe a fan of me, or maybe they are a little bit, but, you know, it wasn't like I was a pro bodybuilder having fans. Mm -hmm. But... Um, I got some respect and I got some notoriety. Mm -hmm. And so when we created Blackstone Labs, the first thing I thought was that with that type of product, which was pro hormones mm -hmm. originally, mm -hmm. there was nobody, and I mean nobody in the world, standing in front of these things saying, hey, this is me, this is mine. And I think that uh, a lot of me and PJ's initial success mm -hmm. was just the willingness to get in front of it and represent the brand. Mm -hmm. Um, because these were things that were, you know, thought of as underground, right? Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, there just was nobody representing uh, these products. Yeah. And um, realistically, you know, we didn't do anything different than anybody else. Um, the, the, the raw ingredients are all basically the same as they should be. But because we stood in front of it and we talked about it and we did videos and we did, you know, we did product videos and education on the, on the things... Uh, and nobody else was doing it, especially with those products. Yeah. Um, and really, honestly, not too many people were doing it at all, which is kind of like when you came in to do it. Correct. Um, there yeah. was nobody standing in front of them saying, hey, we're doing a product review on this product and go through all the science and the ingredients and the taste, yeah. and it just didn't happen. Yeah. So um, as a result of doing that, we started selling much more. And mm -hmm. that interest continued on into you know what my passion is these days, which is digital marketing, mm -hmm. uh, where I, I think I am on the forefront of digital marketing in the world, not just in supplements, yeah. because that's my passion. So I study and I'm into and talk to leaders in, uh, in digital marketing that are not in supplements, but in digital marketing in general. Yep. And, um, but I think it all comes from the same place, um, that seeing me and PJ, because PJ was also uh, well known. He wasn't famous, probably more famous than me, but he was not famous like Ronnie Coleman or Jay uh -huh. Cutler. But because it was two bros standing in front of the camera talking about this pro hormone that we made that nobody else had, or this pre workout, super strong pre workout called Angel Dust, yeah. you know, uh, people were like, oh shit, these are two guys just like us. I can relate to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, why would I buy some anonymous company uh, that who knows who's making it? Um, I'd rather trust these two guys that I know. Yep. And um, and that's kind of how uh, how everything kicked off, and and it all has come into continuing to figure out how to monetize, or or, or now it's really monetize and get the attention, because uh -huh. that's ultimately what you're doing, right? You're trading for this attention and people's definitely. attention. So yeah, yeah. And that's a great it's a great segue into into Redcon One, which is kind of where I want to go now. Yeah. Um, a little bit of background for the listeners. So the first time I met you was in Melbourne, if I, yeah. if I, if I recall. Yeah, went to a steak restaurant. That's correct, yeah. in Melbourne, which was like, you know, pretty much the start. It wasn't the, the right at the start, but it was the early days of Blackstone. Yeah. Um, and you guys at the time were doing Prime as well. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of saw that, you know, that Aaron back yeah. then and kind of saw the rise of that company. Yeah. And then, as a matter of fact, when I when I came and stayed with you at your house um, yeah. a few years ago yeah. was like the week that you launched Redcon 1. So yeah, I think we stayed with you like Monday, Tuesday. Well, and two years ago, right? And two years yeah, ago. Yeah. And the launch was like Thursday. Yeah. So, you know, I've had uh, some some pretty cool kind of behind the scenes. Yeah, you insights. have. You really have. Yeah, and then you <laughs> to, came to, the following year. Yeah, yeah to, to the Singerman Enterprises and, and the kind of the different companies. But Redcon 1 is a... Uh, is, is of particular interest to me and I think is going to be a particular interest to a lot of the listeners because it, it literally, like it kind of just came out of nowhere and exploded. Mm. And I think now that, you know, we, we've been talking for almost an hour and the listeners kind of understand your background, right. it didn't, you know, there, there was a it whole... Just it, exactly, yeah. like there's a whole lot of, you know, experience from your part that had kind of led to the right skill set and the right understanding of marketing and social media attention and the right connections and, and just all of these dots that I was talking about oh, yeah. that now you can see backwards all of these dots connected to, to Redcon 1 and that's what allowed it to you know, literally explode within yeah. the last couple of years since its inception. Uh, talk to me about Redcon 1. So we know that it was, you know, leaving Blackstone, closing that door, opening the new door to Redcon 1. 
why? Why Redcon One? Why another supplement company? You know, you uh, kind of been there and done that, right? Sure, sure. So what? what and I had was, other supplement companies at the time. Yeah. I don't, I don't, people probably know, or maybe they don't know, that I own uh, and I continue to own Dynamic Muscle with Kai Green and sure. I run everything with Dana Lynn Bailey and yeah. Rob Bailey. So I had other businesses uh, going, and uh, and I think, you know, even internally, like with my team, my initial team, you know, the decision to start another company, yeah. I don't think was that clear, but. Like to me, it was pretty crystal clear because I knew that uh, with Blackstone that there was a lot of things that I wish I'd done differently. Sure. And uh, and I learned so much, and we created so much success. I just knew, I just knew, like in my heart, like in my gut, that I could do it again and I could do it better. Sure. And um, and and to be honest, you know, we sat down and uh, we were actually at Flex's gym uh, the two days after the. The, you know, because I had no office, because yeah. I couldn't go back to Blackstone. So yeah. um, I uh, assembled a small team, which is my father-in-law, um, Howard, uh, Eric Hart, who came over uh, and is my vice president of everything, uh, handles quite a bit and of stuff, who just, also has 12 years of experience. I was just going to say, yeah. let's just, just pause on Eric Hart yeah. for the moment, because yeah. for the for the listeners who don't know who Eric Hart is... Silky Tuba, tell him look him up. <laughs> <laughs> That's so Silky, Silky Tuba. tuba. Yeah. But Eric Hart is from, you know, BSN... Royalty, yeah. so to speak. The initial um, group of BSN. The BSN. initial group of BSN, and he kind of came all the way through BSN and, and through the growth of that company, and then you know joined forces with yourself for Redcon One. Yeah. So a little bit of background to, to. I actually hired him a week before the whole split at Blackstone. Yep. Because his uh, he left BSN, and he had a pretty cool uh, deal. They gave him a very large uh, severance pay, mm. um, basically like a year, mm-hmm. and then they told him he had to sit out a year. That was his. Uh, is non-compete. Sure. So he basically worked out with Flex and like hung out with Flex every day. He's yeah. like all day long workout partner yep. for a year. And yep. as soon as the year ended, uh, we had been talking about Blackstone. He was really like, he thought it looked like fun, basically. Yeah. He was like, man, because Glambia at the end, once they bought uh, BSN, the, the fun factor uh-huh. kind of died over uh-huh. there, from what he told me anyway. Um, and so uh, I took him on uh, at Blackstone. He decided, like, I'll do it. He came in as uh, director of international sales mm-hmm. for the guy that I fired that ended up creating the whole big fight with me and uh-huh. PJ. Uh-huh. And, um, and so he was there for that final week, and I'm sure he told me since then he was like, "What? <laughs> what did I get myself into?" Because um, you can imagine. I mean, if anybody knows TJ, he's a uh, he's like a even on happy days, he's a kind of a loud uh, personality. Yeah, you know, so, passionate guy. Yeah, passionate guy. That's a yeah. good way to say it. Um, so um, you know. He walked into this like very explosive environment where I'm sure he was like, "Holy shit, you know, this is this is a bad decision." And uh, it so happened that uh, that when Redcon started, the first person I called was like, "Hey, you want to come over here?" And he's yep. like, "Hell yeah!" Yeah. He's like, "No, I didn't. This wasn't what I thought I was getting into anyway." Uh-huh. Uh, so um, he was one of the first people I called, and uh, and so. Um, he was like, yes, and uh, we had that meeting where we were at Flex's uh, gym. He had a, he still does have an office upstairs, and we sat around the table and we started to kind of like plan out what it was going to be. And so um, I had always um, one of the things that I always believed, and it's something I still talk about when you talk about branding and marketing, mm-hmm. and starting a company, is there's a few things that you always want to keep in mind. You know, ideally, not, not these are not all possible, but you want to have a name that's short, that's memorable. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully, easy to spell, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Uh, be able to get the domain name of that, right? Be able to trademark it. Mm-hmm. And then, um, I, this is where it gets really tough, is have that name mean something. Have it have it actually have meaning. Have an emotional so, connection. Yeah, so yep. it's tough. So yep. to find all those things. And so we had I had met two Navy SEALs that, that I wanted to work with, Brandon Cruz and Ryan Bates, mm-hmm. SEAL Team 6 guys. Mm-hmm. And man, these guys' accomplishments are very long, uh, you know, multiple, many, many tours of duty. They're just awesome. And they're so cool. And when I met them, I was like, man, these guys are are like the coolest guys ever. Yeah. Um, and it, not just because of their accomplishments, but their personalities and like they're funny and smart. And I was like, these guys are, should be our athletes, right? I'm not going to worry about, like, I'm not going to focus on bodybuilding. I'm going to focus on these guys. And so we started thinking of that's how it originally I was like, I want a, a military kind of name, you yeah. know? Uh, what's cooler than fucking these badasses, right? Yeah, that are yeah. funny and, yeah. you know, uh, great yeah. on camera and into fitness. And so we started looking at names and uh, we came across during this search, you know, exhaustive search of Redcon 1. And so Redcon 1 means the highest state of military preparedness or readiness. I was like, damn, that's pretty cool. Like, that's pretty cool. And so uh, we uh, next up, we went to GoDaddy to look up the domain. And uh, the domain was for sale. 
for 5,000 bucks. Uh -huh. And we all sat around and I was like, damn. <laughs> Is it that cool? <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, 5,000, because at the time, you know, you're starting a new company, a domain, it could have been anything. I could have yeah. named it with anything else, and it yeah. could have been $12. So yeah. it was like, and we sat around, and everybody kind of looking at me, and uh, I was like, fuck it, buy it. I was like, buy it. Mm -hmm. And I spent the 5,000 bucks, got the domain, and that was the decision. Mm -hmm. Like, from there on, everything else. And, uh, and we came up with a logo based on the name, and the logo was awesome, and I just felt it. And uh, we, actually, in that initial phase, that when we were, making that decision, I called uh, Dallas McCarver, because uh, he was, uh, on the flip side, I would never want to be all the way away from bodybuilding, because that is my my love, mm -hmm. uh, my initial love. And I thought, man, this is a guy who is not used. Mm -hmm. Like, he was with BSN, he's mm -hmm. this freak of nature, mm -hmm. nice kid, young guy, super strong, so he's functional. You know, it's not just the big muscles, he can actually move weight. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, this is the new Ronnie Coleman, the younger white Ronnie Coleman, but essentially, you know, he can move the same weights as Ronnie. He has the potential, even with BSN. He was even with BSN at the time. And I was like, you know what, I'm gonna give him a call. And uh, I told him the idea for the brand. Mm -hmm. And I told him we're gonna push content and value and we're not gonna push uh, the products. And mm -hmm. we didn't even have products to push at first. We're gonna push, uh, we're gonna hype. We're gonna push the clothing and the hype and we're gonna make it a mystery and it's gonna be the secret nobody's gonna talk about. And uh, cause that's, so like when I, when, and he goes, yes. Yep. He's like, yes. And I was like, well, you have to move to Boca. And he had his whole family in Tennessee and he goes, he, I guess he paused for a second or two and he's like, okay, I'll move, I'll move to Boca. Uh -huh. And a week later he moved to Boca. Uh -huh. And uh, him believing so much, just like Eric believing so much, it helped me know that I was doing the right thing. Yep. And, uh, and we got going right after and I, he, uh, I made him all this clothes. He went and did the uh, Chicago Pro like two weeks after that. And he was wearing all red cunt clothes and Matt Jansen was wearing all red cunt clothes. And, mm -hmm. and it, people were asking what's red cunt on? He's like, I can't say. Because <laughs> I can't tell you. I had to tell everybody, I can't tell you. And uh, we generated all this hype. You know, I was posting on the Red, I personally was posting on the Red Co on social media. So all the initial, probably 25 pictures, it was me writing the, 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 uh, the descriptions or the captions mm -hmm. and uh, me posting the pictures and it didn't have anything to do with supplements. Mm -hmm. uh, and I spent a lot of time thinking about what I was gonna write. And, uh, and we got to 10,000 followers before we ever released what Red Con 1 was. Yep. Uh, based on all the hype and sending the clothes to people. And, uh, and so it was really neat because I got to just from the beginning, from finding that name and the branding and thinking about the, the R1, you know, and, and the, then the game RC1, um, everything was done the right way. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you create an iconic actual brand? All those things that I knew should be done, I was able to actually do. And there's a long list of other things that we did. But um, if you think of, I always think of like, Rolex, you think of the crown, right? Yep. Apple, you think of the Apple. Yep. IBM, you think of the I. I wanted to create something that in our supplement world, our mm -hmm. fitness world that was iconic like that. Mm -hmm. And all of those companies have uh, some similarities. So I try to copy the greats, you know, mm -hmm. stand on the uh, shoulders of giants, right? Of course. And there's some people that did some incredible uh, branding packages that became these iconic companies. And we don't really have, in our industry, mm -hmm. we don't have brands that have um, have real, have done real branding where they have a, a story, they have ideals, they have a message that goes with the company, mm -hmm. and they have uh, consistent branding across everything that they do. Yeah. And um, you know, you talked about interviewing the ghost guys. Like those are guys who are who are really doing it right. That mm -hmm. have thought this through. That obviously it wasn't just thrown up there. Mm -hmm. And um, very rarely in our industry is there anything like that. Because mm -hmm. the big successes, like if you look at like, what's a big success? Like Jack 3D. Mm -hmm. That was because it was a hardcore stimulant product. Mm -hmm. like, what does Jack 3 stand for? Who the fuck knows? It means nothing. No one you know? can spell it. <laughs> yeah, no one can spell it, right? <laughs> but any of them, even like BSN, they don't. They didn't mean anything. It just had the red cool bottles yeah. and had Ronnie. Yeah. Um, so I uh, I tried to stick to that, and as a result, you know, um, I think that Red Con One is the fastest growing supplement sports supplement company in the history of the world. Mm. Um, the revenue numbers that we're doing and the penetration in terms of the world and where we're getting, I don't think has ever been done before, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's obviously working, and I think that we're just touching the we're just in the beginning phases still of where this thing is going to go. Absolutely, uh, and you and you're learning from all the lessons. Yeah, you, you know, from 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 everything you've done in life up yeah. until this point. And I think that's the really you know the 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 coolest thing is unpacking this in this podcast is you know seeing where you know where all of this comes from you know yeah. uh, where does the digital marketing come from where does the branding come from and you can kind of see like you know the journey of Aaron Singerman yeah. Kind of, yeah. you know has led to this point which one is one thing which I want to say Joe because yeah. it's important to mention is that yeah. I because we talked about Eric Hart but I have a fantastic team 
Of course. And, um, you know, I have 40 people in the office now, mm -hmm. full-time people. Um, and uh, that's something that I've been... Um, probably got to be one of my biggest successes is finding really good people yep. that are passionate about what they do, that love being there. At Blackstone, one of the things that I, that I uh, liked the least about um, being there mm -hmm. um, and running, being the CEO of the company, was that I felt like I was the only one who really cared, like put everything into it. Mm -hmm. uh, people left very early. They didn't want to come in on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Like nobody really, it was like, um, like at 4.30, I would look around and there'd be almost nobody there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, like, when I would want to come in or, or if I wanted to do a meeting on a Saturday, people would throw a fit. Yeah. Like, there was just, you know, it was just a very different uh, feeling. Even mm -hmm. in the office, you would walk around, and it seemed like people were just, like, not that happy, mm -hmm. you know? And um, and it felt, you know, there was just like a, it was kind of like a, a fraternity feeling because it was all dudes, all young dudes, basically. Yeah. And it was also, on the flip side, it was also seemed like a, a place people wanted to like do their job and then go. Mm -hmm. Whereas Redcon is a place where everybody is, is like, you walk in, it's like sunlight and happiness and people coming in early and staying late. And when I say, hey, I need you to film Chris Hester on Saturday, people are like, oh yeah, great. Mm -hmm. you know, or you gotta go to New York. And everybody's like, oh, I gotta go. Oh, I got this, you know, it seems like everybody enjoys, actually I know, it's not just seems, they, they enjoy being there, they like doing what they're doing, yeah. and that makes me feel good. And uh, I think as a result, the company does better. Of course. there's this positive energy. Well, it, it, um, it's the team, right? Yeah, there's, only, the team. there's only so much you can do yourself. Yes. Where you get to a point where you have to scale. And, and, and that is what I've learned. I think that the, the biggest thing that I personally have learned is that Blackstone, I tried to do everything. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, I can't create the art. I can't create the labels. I'm not uh, capable. It's not my, yeah. in my skill set. Yeah. But I would want to see everything first. I'd want to be very, very hands-on with every piece of what's going on, mm -hmm. um, which, uh, which I think is good when you start. You know, you want to make sure everything is good. But when, uh, when you are concerned that the customer service is not going good and you're going through emails in the middle of the night to make sure they're answering in the right way or mm -hmm. answering yourself, mm -hmm. it's probably not... Uh, the best way to get to the next level. Correct. And so now I have a lot of people uh, in charge of different departments that are all really good and, and good enough that I don't have to micromanage them to the degree that I'm constantly looking over their shoulder, checking their work. You know, I can go out in June, in June we're going on vacation, Darielle and I, to Cancun. Mm -hmm. And I won't be like, oh, what's going on? You know, oh, this is gonna be, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here now with you, and uh, they're, well, today's Saturday, so they're not all at the office now. But yesterday was a great day, and I only looked at the cameras in the office a few times. Yeah, I yeah. wasn't staring at them and saying, <laughs> are they at their desk? Yeah, watching you know? the yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it was, uh, you know, that's such a big part, because each one of these uh Team leaders like Ray, who does the video, mm -hmm. Monique, who's in charge of all the uh, the marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, we have uh, JP, who's the art director. Um, all these people are, are um, and of course Eduardo, who's third in command, who kind of runs everything to some degree. He's there running everything now. Mm -hmm. These people are all really responsible, and they're good at their job. And I don't have to wonder: Is uh, JP going to be, you know, not at work today, or is he going to be listening to music and playing a video game? You know? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. You've got the, the the right people in the right places, and, and trust. Yeah, very, very important. It's yeah. like, uh, uh, I think as a business gets bigger, if you don't have the right team, man, it can, well, you, you, it can fall you, apart. Or, or, or you reach a glass ceiling. Yeah, you reach a glass and ceiling. You won't be able to get through it. So, yeah. yeah, and it's tough because you know, as, you, as you've grown, yep. it's, it's tough because a lot of times I, I see the problems mm -hmm. and I see the people that are not right, and it's mm -hmm. very difficult for me uh, to like fire them, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm such a softy, yeah. um, but I've gotten better. And, uh, you know, um, it's, I, you know, it's certainly nothing that I look forward to or that I'm, it's something that I enjoy, but sometimes, you know, just because they're, doesn't mean they're bad. And that's what I tell people too. And, and quite often, because there are people that I've had to fire that I like, and I'll be like, Hey man, it doesn't mean that you are a bad guy or it just means that this is not the right time. It's not the right fit. Right. Yep. Not the right time or place for yep. you yep. because I've been fired from mm -hmm. dozens of jobs. That's what mm -hmm. I tell. I've been fired from. I got fired from rolling burritos. I got fired from. I got when I was a kid. I got fired from everything. Mm -hmm. That's the, the. You know, we were talking about this on a different podcast. Is that I've been fired from dozens of jobs. Now, if I would have that job now, they'd be like, "Holy shit, this guy's amazing." <laughs> so you know what I mean? So, timing. Yeah, timing. Yeah, it's timing. Yeah, it's timing. So um, that's a uh, cutting people is a, is, a, is a tough thing to do, but sometimes that's what's got to happen. Yeah. And then as a result, you get other people or I've been uh, very scared when people have quit that I think are good. But then you, before you know it, if you do a good job of hiring, you get somebody just as good or better. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Uh -oh. Aaron, to, to, to finish off, what's next for Redcon Mom? 
Oh. World domination, <laughs> Joe. World domination. <laughs> loaded question. Yeah, no, loaded I, question. I, but, but what's the, you know, you, when you started the company, obviously you had a vision and, you, right. you know, you saw where you wanted it to go and we're here two Almost three years later. Two years later. Two years later. Yeah, not that um, long. And uh, you know, you're at you're at a certain level now. So, you know, what does the vision look like now? What, what, what's the next step? So I always said uh, in my head, right, when I started Red Cohen, I probably didn't vocalize it to you either time that you're there. But my goal really has always been to be the biggest supplement company, sports supplement company in the world. Mm-hmm. So when they think, you know, now you may think of like an Optimum, or depending on, I don't know. Probably Optimum, right? Glambia sure. in general, yep. or uh, Muscle Tech, which is much bigger. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's big in Australia, but other countries, it's crazy big still. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole IOV company, you know, yep. um, like that's where I uh, that's where I envision myself. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where I would like to be, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, I have uh, goals. The one, the one goal. You know, I focus a lot on numbers, which you know, I guess that's just me. I'm just a numbers guy. You know, 100 million bucks mm-hmm. in revenue for a year mm-hmm. has always been a number that I've always wanted to hit. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely uh, a big goal that I focus on uh, mm-hmm. a lot. And how do we get there? And are we tracking in the right direction to hit that? Yeah. But the ultimate goal is to be the biggest supplement company in the world, and um, and that's and I try to base all my decisions. Uh, based on where I want to go, which is a big, like if I look back, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes focusing on like what's good for right now, mm-hmm. you know, how to make more money today or whatever, and, and not thinking about like long-term goals and you know, stuff like legacy or how you want people to think of you and or where you want to be eventually, because uh-huh. your actions are going to be very, for me anyway, are going to be very different based on am I thinking about how I'm going to make more money today mm-hmm. or how I'm going to, you know, end up where am i going to end up and and uh, now that i have three young sons you know it's like i think a lot about like how i want them to think of me and and uh how i want you know because that that is uh, the number one importance for me is like that is number one mm-hmm. uh how i want to end is more important than how i'm going to get the next month sure and i understand that for a lot of people it's tough to do because you're thinking about paying the bills right or surviving, and I've fortunately gotten to a place where I'm not focused on that. I'm focused more on where I'm going, mm. and, uh, and I think that it really changes the way that you behave to people, yeah. how you act. And if you can manufacture that earlier than I've been able to, I think that you will be much happier in, in your life. But it's ultimately like the the material possessions, the happiness is very fleeting. Uh-huh. Uh, I've had everything, man. I've got all the fancy cars and all that, and none of that made me happy. But for a few minutes, I mean, I won't say that. Uh, that it doesn't make you happy because having an awesome car certainly makes you happy, but it's very, it's very it's finite. Tran- transient. And, yeah, yeah, it's transient and yeah. it's over, and then then it becomes normal. Uh-huh. And uh, but you know, the stuff that lasts longer is uh, is the more important stuff. Legacy. Yeah, legacy. It's the so. the, the uh, number in your bank account versus the number of people at your funeral when it's all over. Yeah. Is, is the you know the, I agree. the polarization between what your, your ultimate goal is. One of the things that I say that, that I'm big on at the moment as well, Aaron, is I say, you know, plan and have vision on the macro in the long term and then execute on the micro in the short term. Right. And I think that, you know, that's uh, you're, you're a big advocate of that as well and a, yeah. and a personification of that is always, you know, or at least now, you know, look for, to the future, plan long term, plan macro, what does that yeah. look like? But execute day to day, be persistent, be, you know, persevere and do what you need to do Every single day yeah, to, to that. get to that, you know, and yeah. it's it's the joining dots thing once again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> joining yeah. them forwards, joining them backwards. Yeah, Aaron, thank you so much, man. You're welcome. It's this been, was fun. Uh, it's been a great chat. I yeah. think we've uh, you know we've covered a whole bunch of content that I wasn't honestly I wasn't expecting to cover, but <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> but it's good. Yeah. A whole uh, you know I actually look forward to listening to this one back because there's uh, there's a bunch of stuff in there that, that that I'm quite excited that we got to speak about. So awesome. You know, not just supplements, but, yeah, uh, but yeah, a whole yeah. lot of uh, a whole lot of other things that I think people are going to take a whole lot of value from. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm excited to hear what people think, and uh, I'm glad we had a chance to do it. This kind of stuff, uh, the business stuff, is is really what I'm I am personally more interested in now you know Likewise. so yeah so this yeah. is really cool and if I can help uh, if anybody got any value and got any help out of this you know that's I mean that's really 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 it's all about and uh, I think my story uh, basically I hope my story conveys the fact that wherever you are in life mm-hmm. um, it's not too late to uh, to really achieve probably more than you think is possible because when I think about my life and, I, and I, where I'm at and what I'm doing, I definitely, when I was 27 in 2007, mm-hmm. I certainly would not have predicted 
any of this stuff. I couldn't have said that I would be doing this or, you know, I walk into an office of 40 people that are looking at me as the boss mm. and, uh, and have three beautiful kids that love me and a wife and, you know, I would never have said that this was gonna happen. So it just shows that, uh, that even though you may not think that it's possible, that anything truly is possible if you, like you said, one step at a time, mm -hmm. focus on moving in the right direction and don't ever stop. Plan on the macro, execute yeah, there on the macro. There it is. There it is. Yeah, there it Aaron, is. thank you, man. You're welcome, of I course. I appreciate it. Of course. We've got an expo to get to. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Massive Joe Show. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform, whether it be SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, Stitcher, or tune in. And if you enjoyed listening to this episode of The Massive Joe Show, ensure that you give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcasting platform. Until next time, we're coming to you from MassiveJoes.com. Stay massive.